So good morning and uh, welcome to the discrete mathematics introductory course. Um, so we will have lectures and practical classes. We start with the lecture. So we have some people in the room and uh, also more people online who join these lectures. And uh, well, let's get started. So I will start with uh, the lecture itself and all organizational information will be in the end. So let's just proceed and then we'll discuss some formal moments. Um, so this course is uh, devoted to background of discrete math and computational complexity ideas. So this famous P and NP stuff. Well, which are somehow useful for applications in data science, you know, broadly understood sense. So it means that actually uh, computer science in general. So uh, given that the time for this course is really limited, it's one block, one module, and uh, we'll have something like, I think, six weeks only. Uh, so we had to choose a basic central topic around which we are going to organize the course. And it will be used as a running example for the ideas we are going to discuss here. And uh, after several iterations of the course, we stabilized at using Boolean logic as the central topic, the central moment inside this course. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about Boolean logic you should always keep in mind that we actually use it as a model example. So uh, it's not the purpose, the exact purpose of the course to teach you, say, the theory of Boolean functions, but the idea is that we'll grasp some more general ideas on the example of Boolean functions because they're very simple and also classic for discrete mathematics. But this will be not the only one. We'll also discuss graphs. We'll discuss a bit of formal grammars, but only a bit just for practical purposes to do your programming assignments. and something else, but this will be the center. And let's remind the basics of it. So uh, many of you probably know that, but as you will see, I will try to look at these things at a bit of another angle. So Boolean functions <coughs> operate on the smallest non-trivial set with two elements. So if you know one element, it's nothing interesting, but with two elements, interesting things come. So an Henry Boolean function is a function which has n arguments, each of which is either 0 or 1, and the result is also 0 or 1. So, and it's a finite object. So discrete mathematics operates with finite objects, not like, say, uh, continuous mathematics calculus operates on infinite functions, infinite spaces of high cardinality and stuff like that. But here is just a finite object. It can be represented by a table, which is so-called a truth table, and it has two power n rows. So you have two power n possible values for arguments. Each one is either 0 or 1, so you have 2 to the power of the number. And uh, uh, at each row, you uh, put 0 or 1 as the answer. So this is the full description of a Boolean function. Why it is called truth table? Well, because it's connected to logic. So commonly you can understand zero as false and one as true. And the result is, say, a logical statement. So this is another view on the Boolean function or a Boolean formula, as we'll define it in several minutes. We have this number of Boolean functions. It's uh, two to the power of two to the power of n, so a great number. Which means, for example, that it's uh, meaningless to try to, say, enumerate all of them. It's uh, a very big number for any sort of computation. For example, if you have four unary Boolean functions and 16 binary ones. So things grow quite rapidly. OK. Um, one. Um, from unary functions, which have only one argument, the only interesting one is the negation, which uh, flips the value of the variable. And other, others are non-interesting, though. There is also the identity function and two constants, but they do something meaningless. Here we have the only one and only non-trivial thing. 
okay, from binary functions, we have 16 of them, but uh, the things we are going to be interested in are the following. So we have conjunction or and, we have disjunction or or, and we have implication, which is if then. And here are the truth tables. So the interesting one is the implication. You see that if uh, the left argument is zero, so it's false, then uh, the right one is, or th that the implication is considered true, uh, not dependent on the second argument. So falsity entails anything. True follows from false. This could be a bit sort of unnatural, but uh, this means that if you fail to justify the premise, uh, the implication is automatically justified that it should be true. But uh, false does not entail true. So one does not entail zero. And one entails one, of course. So these are the basic functions we're going to use, plus negation as a unary one. Uh, and these form a complete system of Boolean functions in the following sense, that any Boolean function can be represented as a composition of these guys. Actually, two of them are sufficient, say negation or conjunction, but this indeed is a complete system. So, for example, this is a majority function. Well, it's also monotone, therefore we don't have negation, it's not have implication in the formula. The majority function just, it's like voting. So you have three people and they post a vote. They say, I vote for or against something. And we say that uh, the whole community says yes, if at least two of them vote one. And this is exactly the formula which represents it. So we can see that it's X and Y, uh, or X and Z, or Y and Z. So at least two guys should vote for this. This is not the only formula which represents the majority function, but one of them. Um, so such representations, in the sense of this theorem, can be formalized as a Boolean formula. So a Boolean formula, formally speaking, is defined by this scary formal definition. It's a formal expression constructed using our operations. So formally speaking, we have variables. So x, y, z, p, q, and stuff like that. We have two constants for 0 and 1. So in logic, they're usually denoted like that, bottom top. But this is efficiently 0 and 1. We can use them as constants. Uh, well, uh, in the definition here, in this theorem, we formally didn't use constants, but uh, they are expressible using, say, negation and constants. So, um, the Boolean function can be represented as a composition of negation, uh, uh, yeah, uh, going about constants. Uh, you can actually say that zero is x and dot x, and one is x or not x. So this means that or it's not, not, not one is not zero. So it's uh, adding these constants actually doesn't add much to our expressible possibilities here. So uh, if A and B are formulae, then we can construct more complex formulae by uh, adding these operations. So you can say and, you can say or, you can do implication and you can negate. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the thing which uh, happens here. Okay, mm -hmm. so we shall consider Boolean formulae as logical formulae which represent logical truth. So there is a classic example of a syllogism that if it is raining that there are clouds on the sky, if there are no, there, and we know that there are no clouds on the sky, that therefore it's not raining. So this is a logical uh, statement which can be represented by the following Boolean formula. R means raining, C means clouds, and you see that R implies C. This is uh, uh, our first premise. The second premise is that it's not C, and we conclude that it's not R. And this is, so this thing as any Boolean formula represents a Boolean function. So it depends on the values of the variables. But if you try to construct the truth table for this function, what will happen on the, in the right column? The, all the values will be one, right? So independently from the values of R and C, we'll get true, right? Because this represents a valid 
logical statement. It's always valid. It does not depend on the values of R and C. So if it is not raining, this is true because this R, not R is true, and the implication is true. So if it is raining, then in order to, for the left hand side to be true, it should also there should also be clouds. So C should be one, but C is zero, not C is then zero, and then the premise is zero, and the implication also holds. So this is formula which is true, that is returns one for any values of R and C. And such formula are called tautologies. So they represent logically valid things. And uh, this is one of the sort of Boolean formula we're going to discuss. So we've shift from uh, representing Boolean formula to representing tautological truth. So valid logical inference. And the question whether a formula is a tautology is algorithmically decidable just due to the finiteness of the, all the situation. So we can say that uh, just we take all possible values for the variables and compute the value of the formula. So these are called assignments. We assign zeros and ones to our variables and we compute the value of the formula and it's going to be zero or one. So um, this algorithm is indeed quite slow because it should check two to the power of n possible assignments. So checking one assignment is easy, right? So if you have values for all variables, then you uh, can check whether for each, uh, then you just substitute them and routinely compute your Boolean formula using just the truth tables. But uh, the number of assignments is large, it's exponential, and therefore we say that this algorithm requires exponential time, and usually such algorithms are in, impractical. So using them in practice are, is not that good. Uh, and the question is whether there is a faster algorithm, and I will keep this as an intrigue till maybe the next lecture, or the end of this lecture. So, and here, was, I, I believe that uh, say, tautological truth and stuff like that is things that you basically know from, say, your bachelor courses or somewhere else. But we're going to discuss a dual notion, which is maybe not that well known, which is satisfiability. So a satisfiable formula is a formula which is true under at least one assignment. So not all, but only maybe one. And such an assignment is called a satisfying assignment. So this is all, of, all also decidable. You again enumerate all assignments, but here you stop when you reach at least one satisfying one. So in the tautological case, dually, if you return zero, you say it's not a tautology. Here, if you get one, you say it's a satisfying one. So satisfiability is dual to being a tautology. That this is the thing we're going to use many times, so please try to grasp it that A is a tautology if and only if not A is not satisfiable. So not not, double negation. Why? Because if A is a tautology, if you negate it, then you will get all zeros. So you got all ones, now you get all zeros. And uh, this means that um, uh, it is not satisfiable. If it is not a tautology, then uh, it has one assignment, at least one assignment on which it returns zero then the negation will return one on this assignment and you will get it not it's a satisfiability. So this is the dual notion and from the algorithmic point of view this duality will also be there because if you solve a satisfiability problem by taking negation and then inverting your answer you will solve tautology, tautology problem and duality. And actually, satisfiability is going to be a very general model example of situations where you seek for existence of an object with certain properties or realizability of a certain set of constraints. So it's very general and it's a, mm, a special case of a well-known constraint satisfaction problem. So searching for an object on the web, searching on a subgraph with specific properties, searching on a, say, colorability of a graph, Many of these things can be represented by satisfying, well, not always a Boolean formula, but some logical formula. So you can formulate your specification as a logical statement. Here is a Boolean formula A and search for satisfying assignments. So it's a very general model example. So.
So now we're going to discuss specific forms of Boolean formulae. Again, it's sort of reminder, hope for most of you, which are disjunctive conjunctive normal forms. So we start with the literal. So it's either a variable or a negation of a variable. Uh, negation will be written in short using this overline bar. So it's just a matter of notation. And an elementary conjunction is a conjunction of literals. Elements or their negation. And a DNF is a disjunction of elementary conjunction. So it's a big, so in the, the first letter means what is big. So the big disjunction includes small conjunctions. And usually a CNF, which is conjunctive normal form, is a conjunction of elementary disjunction. So we just flip conjunction and disjunction, <coughs> that dual notion. And these elementary disjunctions or conjunctions, they're called clauses. So the uh, elementary Conjunction is a DNF clause, and elementary disjunction is a CNF clause. Vice versa. And there are trivial cases. If you have a degenerate DNF with zero clauses, so just no clauses, and it's, and it's an empty disjunction, it's uh, declared as false. And usually the empty CNF is true. So why is it so? Because DNF clauses, they are part of a big disjunction. So they add some possibilities. If you take a DNF and add a new clause, then you will have more, possibly more satisfying assignment, right? And if you uh, have no clauses, then you have no possibilities, it should be false. While CNF imposes constraints. So if you add an extra clause into your conjunctive normal form, this means that you add a conjunction with it and you need to satisfy more constraints than before. So adding new clauses makes it harder to satisfy the CNF. And therefore, if it is empty, then there's no constraints and it should be always true. So the, this is just the notion of empty disjunction, empty conjunction. And uh, a specific case of DNF is a full DNF where each clause contains all variables, either uh, in the, just them, just the variables or their negations. So if a clause contains both, it's trivial, it's just true because it's X or not X, but here we have like that. And the full DNF can be obtained from the truth table in the following way. So we can just an arbitrary uh, Turner Boolean function. It is not meaningful in a sense, just for example. So we take this truth table, we see in which rows we have one. And for these rows, we just write the corresponding conjuncts, elementary conjunctions. So we say that, okay, if all of them are zero, so it means that not X and not Y and not Z, then this should be true. And we'll put this clause there. And also for other units. And then we just take the big disjunction of them. And this will be a disjunctive normal form, which is called a full DNF. And it will represent the given Boolean form, Boolean function, as you can easily see from the truth table. So this, by the way, proves our theorem that any function, so how, how can you prove that any function is representable using Conjunction, disjunction, and all, using the full DNF, for example. It's not the only way, but this will always work. It's not always optimal, of course, so we have obtained this DNF, but you can optimize it in maybe here in two ways, just by gluing two clauses. So here you see that you have X and not Y and not Z, or X and not Y and Z. So it means that if X and not Y is true, then independently of Z, we have true. So we can glue them up and say there's only one of them. Or we can alternatively do with the same with not y and not y and x and z here. But nevertheless, the full DNF being usually a big one is usually is the standard way of representing a Boolean function. And this gives us completeness. In the even without implication, with uh, negation and uh, conjunction disjunction. But uh, moreover, by De Morgan laws. These are just equivalences which are true for any values of A and B. Uh, you can express conjunction in terms of disjunction or dually disjunction in terms of conjunction. And therefore, already these form complete systems. So for people who are interested in minimal complete systems, there exists an operation which is by its own a complete system, which is the Schaeffer prime or Pierce arrow, the two of them. But, uh, Two of them are already sufficient, and in particular, implication can be expressed in terms of negation and disjunction, not A or B, either the premise is false or the 
not exclusively, or the uh, conclusion is true. And by De Morgan, you can retranslate re it using conjunction. By De Morgan and double negation. So uh, this is the proof of that theorem, which is quite trivial. I would say. And the DNF can be translated into a CNF by distributivity, that uh, disjunction distributes over conjunction, but also you can do it using uh, a truth table by excluding the zero lines. So DNF was full DNF was constructed by including the one line. This is constructed by excluding the zero line. And this is the, the same example, actually. And at each step, what we do is, so, OK, it should be not the case that it is 0, 0, 1, right? Because this is 0. Then we say either x should be true, and here is false, or y should be true, or the z should be false, and here it is true. So we exclude the situation where we get zero. And we do this for all zero lines, and then we just put the conjunction. And these constraints, they rule out all the lines where we have zero and give us the uh, representation of our function. So it's dual to full CNF. So there we include one line, here we exclude zero line. Uh, and now about satisfiability. So for DNF, checking satisfiability is easy. Why? Well, because uh, we take an elementary conjunction, a clause. If this clause is consistent, which means that it does not include both x and not x, then this clause itself is satisfiable, right? Because it, for any value, it includes either itself or its negation. And then if it includes its, that, that variable, we put one. If it includes a negation, then we put zero. If the clause does not include a variable, then we just put arbitrary value. But if we satisfy one clause of the DNF, it is a big disjunction. We have already satisfied the whole DNF. So checking satisfiability is easy. Uh, checking tautologicity is going to be hard. Do you, or everything is dual. So if we satisfy one clause, we satisfy the whole DNF. And the algorithm just checks all the clauses. It tries to satisfy. For CNFs, the satisfiability is a non-trivial question. This is what we're going to discuss. Translating from CNF to DNF doesn't help here. Well, it doesn't help much. Because one could say, OK, we take a CNF and just translate into a DNF and check satisfiability for that. But this translation, either using distributivity or using the truth table, will give us uh, could give us exponential blow up. So the, uh, the, usually, if, uh, if you say C full DNFs and CNFs, if a full DNF is uh, short, it, it means that uh, there are not so many lines with one. But that means there are many lines with zero. And uh, these lines will give us a very big full CNF. And dually, if you have a short full CNF, then the full DNF will be big. So this means that translations between DNF and CNF are usually inefficient, and they could increase the size exponentially. And in this case, you will not gain anything. So it's uh, the same as just checking for satisfying assignments in the truth table. And uh, in the second part of the lecture, we're go going to establish uh, satisfy, prove a formula that it is a tautology or dissatisfying it using proving in a logical system. So uh, a well-known thing, which we are not going to discuss in this course, is that if the formula is a tautology, then you can establish it by proving it in a, in a logical system, which is called classical propositional calculus. So this is a contrast with checking uh, assignments. So checking assignments, uh, logicians call it semantic approach. So you try to impose some meaning on the Boolean values, and the meaning is easy, it's just zero or one, and check that under all possible meanings, the formula will be true. Proving means that you do something, do some reasoning, formal or informal, towards the formula. So for example, in our example is raining and clouds, we can reason in a sense, so, okay, raining means clouds, therefore not clouds means not raining. Aha, uh -huh, we have not clouds, therefore we have not raining. So uh, in order to make this course more interesting, also closer to practice, we're going to consider dual situation. We're going to disprove satisfiability using also a specific form of logical reasoning, which is called resolution method. And using this, we could also establish tautologicity of uh, Boolean formula because we take formula A, we consider its negation, 
we disprove its satisfiability and therefore we prove its uh, general truth. And this is written here that for duality, proving that A is a tautology is equivalent to disproving satisfiability of its negation. So the resolution method is a method which is applied to formulae which are presented already in CNM. And they are presented as a list or set of clauses. So the only rule is resolution, which is written in the following form, which means that if you have already in your CNF a clause which includes P, and in another clause which includes not P, and also something else. So of course P should is not required to be the last formula. We, see, we know that uh, disjunction is associative and commutative, so each clause is just sort of set of literals. And uh, if in one clause we have P, and in another clause we have not P, then we're allowed to construct a new clause, which is A or not B, which means that you remove P from one clause, uh, not P from the second one, and glue them into one clause. This is the resolution rule. So using uh, this resolution rule, we augment our CNF with new clauses. So we take one clause, another one, and we uh, take a new one, then we can apply it once more and once more and once more and add new clauses. And at some point we could arrive at a contradictive clause, which is the empty one. As we know, the empty disjunction is false. And how can we obtain this empty clause using resolution? Well, if we have one clause which is just P, so it includes only one literal which is P, and another one is not P, then applying resolution will result in an empty clause because both A and B are empty. And this exactly means that in our CNF we have P and not P. And P and not P is just basic contradiction. And uh, this results in uh, a contradiction. And this is a theorem that a CNF is not satisfiable if and only if one can obtain the empty clause by applying resolutions to it. So we start with our CNF, we apply, apply this rule, and if we obtain the empty clause, then we say that it's not satisfiable. So the if part, which is soundness, correctness, it's easy. Because if you have an assignment which satisfies both A or P and B or not P, it will also satisfy A or B. How is it proved? Okay. Let's see, let's look at this assignment and understand which value it assigns to P. If P is true, then not P is false, right? Uh, but if not P is false, then B should be true because B or not P is validated and it's validated not by P, but by not P is validated by B. But then A or B is true. And dually, if uh, P is false, then we should validate A. Because A or not or A or P is true and uh, P is false, so A should be true. And again, we validate A or B. So this case analysis shows that if both of these are satisfiable by some assignment, then the same assignment satisfies A or B. So this means that if we add new clauses using resolution, we do not break any satisfying assignments. So if, it's, if we had a satisfying assignment, then it's going to be inherited by all the new clauses we add. But if we arrive at the empty clause and it has no satisfying assignment, it's false. And therefore, there could, could be no satisfying assignment in the beginning, because any assignment of the original CNF is inherited to the augmented CNF. And the empty clause is not satisfied. And the only if part is completeness, so it's a harder task. It says that if, a, for a, if something is not satisfiable, then this particular method of refutation will work. So if something is, is not satisfiable, then we can show it using this particular resolution method and we'll, be, we'll prove this next time. It's not so hard, but just a, a theorem. And this gives us an algorithm for checking satisfiability, right? It's based on the notion of saturation. So we just exhaustively apply all resolutions until we can. So if we see that a resolution can be applied by obtaining and obtain a new clause, we do it. And we end up when uh, no new clauses could be generated. So resolutions could still be applied, but what, what they generate is indeed what we already have. Well, in an algorithm, of course, we can do it in a more accurate way. We say just mark, somehow we mark the pairs of uh, clauses which were already processed. If we have two clauses and we did resolution, 
Of course, we will not do it once more. We'll just add it. So we'll discuss the details further. It will be one of your programming assignments. To... And the CNF is satisfiable if and only if its saturation does not include the empty clause. So if uh, an empty clause was generated in, during the process of saturation, we can say that, OK, we, say we, we obtained an empty clause and uh, we're done. But if it is uh, not obtained, then we use completeness. By completeness theorem, if it was not satisfiable, then we, could, we should have obtained the empty clause because we tried all possible resolutions. But if we didn't obtain it, it means that the formula is satisfiable. And uh, this algorithm in this form as it is presented does not give us the satisfying assignment. So it's sort of non-constructive reasoning. So it saturates and says, OK, it's, it's satisfiable. But actually, from this saturation, using some extra trick, we could also obtain a satisfying assignment. And we'll see it in the future. So the resolution method, as I said, it works only for conjunctive normal forms. And when checking for a formula B in a tautology, it is convenient to translate it into the DNF. Because if you negate a DNF, you obtain a formula which can be easily translated into CNF, right? By De Morgan. So you have a negation of a big disjunction. So this negation is a conjunction of negations. And these negations negate DNF clauses, which are conjunctions. Again, by De Morgan, they are translated into elementary disjunctions and these elementary disjunctions are in their turn uh, disjunctions of literals or maybe double negations of variables which are equivalent to variables themselves and for implications please keep in mind the following equivalences which allow translating them into CN, uh, cnf or dnf at your choice actually so it's uh, using one of them so for negation you will have conjunctive disjunction example so this is a formula there is one uh, parenthesis missing in the end. It should be closed, closing bracket in the end. How do you think? Is it a tautology or not? Well, if it's not that easy, well, we, maybe some of you just could recognize it. Usually it's one of the axioms of the Hilbert calculus for classical logic, but it's better that you didn't recognize it because we'll now use the general method to show it or to decide with it. Let's negate it. So here is the negation. OK, let's take a glance at that. So what does it mean to negate an implication? As we see here, negating an implication means that you have to uh, say that the premise is true and the conclusion is false, A and not B. Here we have several implications. So um, the general conclusion is R. And all other guys are actually uh, premises. And they will all come in this big conjunction as premises. So we should postulate all premises and refute the conjunction. We have not R, we have P. And these implications are represented as uh, disjunctions in a positive way. So P implies Q is not P or Q. And P implies Q implies not P or not Q or R. Right? And now we use resolution we're going to well we're not going to saturate we're going to we are, we are going to stop when we get false so these are just these clauses but written down as a list not as a big conjunction of them but when they're in the list it means that they are connected with conjunctions and we apply resolution first one is here so we take the first and the third and uh, remove p so you have not p and oq or not q or r and you have just P. So when you remove P from the third one, we'll get empty. If we remove not P from the first one, we get not Q or R. And we take A or B. But here one of these is empty. So we just take B, not Q or R. Is this clear? Understandable? So in, in this is actually, an, in this variant is an application of a well-known rule, which is called modus ponens. Because we have just P and we have not P or something. What does it mean not P or something? It means that P implies that guy, right? P arrow, not Q or R. Well, it is here. It's P implies Q implies R. So having P and having this guy, we, we just conclude that Q, not Q or R is true. But this is done formally by resolution. We just cancel P and not P. Next, we can take Q and uh, 
cancelled with not Q, so not P or Q, and Q, uh, not Q or R, we take not P and or R. What do we do next? Next we get R by taking P and not P or R. So P implies R, and we have P, therefore we have R. And we are writing the contradiction because we have R and not R. We again formally apply a resolution, get an empty clause, which is the false one. This means it's not satisfiable. What about complexity? Is it better than just uh, checking uh, one by one the satisfy possibly satisfying assignments? So, unfortunately, in general case, the saturation can be exponential. So the CNF could grow, and this will be, a, by, by the way, one of the exercises at the class for you to uh, find such a CNF, which says under saturation gets big. But there is a specific clause where each uh, clause, a specific case where each clause is bounded by two literals. So no, no, in each clause we have no more than two. It's something like P or Q, or not P or Q, which is P implies Q, or just P. The empty clause could also be there, but empty clause yields contradiction immediately. So. And here, resolution works really fast. Why? Because if you have a two-bounded clause, a clause at most two elements inside it, and you apply a resolution to two of them, you will get also a clause bounded by two. Because you have, say, P and, or not Q, and you have R or Q, you remove Q and not Q, and again you get two at maximum. But if you have, say, three clauses, so clauses of three, applying resolution will give you, what, four, right? Because we have three minus one, three minus one, two plus two is four. And this, is, this gives you the growth. And with two, you don't have a growth. So if you have a specific form of CNF, which is a two CNF, then you will get really a fast thing. So not any Boolean formula can be represented by a two CNF, unfortunately. But even if it, if it is large. But here we have a good algorithm. And the total number of two bounded clauses with the rough estimation is bounded by this, this polynomial. Four n squared, two n, and one. So what is four n squared? You have n variables, n is the number of variables. So you have n variables, and that means that you have two n literal variable or negation. And in each clause, you can have at the first position you can have two n, and the second position you can also have two n. That means it is squared. Well, actually, this is gross because uh, we don't care for say flipping them. It will be the same clause actually. So we should divide by two or something like that. And also if they're two the same, you can just contract them, but this is just an upper bound. So what is two n plus one? So you can also have a clause which includes only one variable, only one literal, a two n of such clause, and also we can have the empty clause. But this is a polynomial estimation. And therefore checking satisfiability for two CNF can be performed in polynomial time. So uh, the algorithm just tries to generate all these guys, and uh, each application of resolution is, of course, fast. It can be done in polynomial time, bounded by a polynomial, or actually it can be done very fast. So, but uh, we'll discuss some some ideas in the in the next class. But uh, of course, this is doable. So no, no exponential growth, just to find two. Uh, clauses which could possibly apply use resolution for them. Um, and uh, the total number of uh, clauses which could appear in a saturated CNF is bounded by this polynomial, so it's going to be formally polynomial time. And uh, now, this is basically all for the, say, mathematical material, and the end of this lecture will be devoted to some, say, metaphilosophical speculations. So, we have been discussing such things as polynomiality, exponentiality. So, we said that being exponential is hard and big and uh, non tractable. Being polynomial is something good. Why? So, I, I did it without any extra comments. So, why is it so? Why is so? Of course, all of you know that an exponential grows faster than any polynomial. This is just standard uh, thing from calculus. 
the 2 to the power of n, it uh, overraises any polynomial when n is going to be big. So the first thing we should note is that it's all cons concerns only what is called asymptotic behavior. So uh, the uh, number n, which is the size of input in a sense, it should be large. It should be uh, actually 10 to infinity. Well, it's what they call the big data in a sense. So if your data is very small, then uh, all these estimations could be in vain because our exponential could be smaller than the polynomial. It's standard situations. And uh, actually, I have... I came across such situations in uh, parsing in formal linguistics where you have a sentence and your parsing algorithm is exponential. Wow, it's bad. But because the sentence in English is usually not more than, say, 20 words uh, in the UK, in the US, it's even shorter, uh, then uh, actually the algorithm could work fast if we apply such like, clever heuristics or something like that. So all these um, uh, discussions about polynomiality, about all these estimations, they are asymptotic. So they are for big values of the input data, for big values of n. And uh, traditionally, an algorithmic problem is considered sort of practically solvable if there is polynomial bound on the uh, of the uh, time of the algorithm. So polynomially bounded means that even in the worst case, it takes uh, no more than p of length of x steps. And P is a fixed polynomial, so it does not depend on the input, it depends only on the algorithm. And model uh, X is uh, the input length. So, of course, we suppose that the longer is the input, the more time it takes for the algorithm to proceed. But um, nevertheless, uh, it should be bounded by a polynomial. And traditionally, this is uh, considered as good algorithms. Algorithms that run slower than any polynomial bound, so they'd say take exponential time or even bigger than considered not practically useful. And of course, it's a very gross approximation of being practically tractable. So if you take a polynomial which has a huge degree, then in practice it will be useless. And actually, even cubic algorithms are already suspicious to be very slow. Uh, quadratic are some somewhere okay, somewhere not. But say if you have power of 10 or 100 as here, it's uh, absolutely useless. Also, as I said, if you on the other side, if you have small input data, then your uh, exponential estimations could be not that bad. And also there are some more subtle situations that here you say that this is an estimation of the worst case. So even the slowest, so there could be data which is easy for an algorithm to process and, and some data could be hard. In some situations, it is possible that there are some bad inputs on which the algorithm works really slowly, but on most inputs, say, it works fast, and this could be okay. Or the algorithm could be probabilistic or something like that. So this is a gross approximation of what is being practically solvable. But in real practice, of course, they wish better complexity bounds than, say, n log n for sorting, for example, something like that. But however, well, why polynomiality is good as a theoretic measure of being a practically a useful algorithm because it's robust. The notion of polynomiality of an algorithm is independent from the details of the implementation and even from the computational model. So if you say that your algorithm works n log n, you should be very careful about how it's really implemented, what data structures you use, how do you access them and stuff like that. But if you say that, okay, my algorithm is polynomial and let these programmers say, uh, I'm a theoretical computer scientist, I invented a polynomial algorithm and these programmers will optimize it, then this will will not change if I uh, implement it in different ways or if I uh, shift it into a, another computational model, port it onto another architecture, stuff like that. The degree of the polynomial could could modify, but the polynomiality itself will keep. So, for example, a problem which is polynomially solvable on a real computer, which is, say, let's see something like RAM model. So you have memory, you can access any uh, part of the memory by a natural number, which is the address, so the usual, say, computer as you, you, you usually program on. And on the other side, you have one tape Turing machine. So I'm not supposing that you know details of Turing machines by now, but what is a Turing machine? You have a tape. On the tape, you keep your data, and uh, the operating unit sees only one cell of the tape. And if it wants to access data which is far away, it should 
step by step go there and find the place there. It looks funny and it's uh, actually a theoretical model of computing introduced by Turing. But uh, in old days, this was a real, say, uh, real physical devices which operated like that. Because uh, now we use, say, uh, SSDs, flash um, memory, or um, hard disk drives, which have random access, at least to some extent. But in older days, there were tapes, real magnetic tapes, on which the data was stored. And accessing the data involved physically running this tape, and uh, people optimized their algorithms in order to make them a sort of linear in their access to data. Of course, it has some, had some small amount of internal memory, let's say operational memory, but it, it, it couldn't include the whole, so you couldn't upload the whole file there. Um, of course, such problems in a so higher level can appear also today if you have, say, distributed systems where different parts of data are kept on different computers on the net. The data is enormous. You cannot just take it to some uh, one computer and computer everything there, and the uh, network of interaction is costly, and therefore you can also optimize. But so if you re-implement your program on this one tape Turing machine, the degree of your polynomial will become bigger. Why? Well, uh, because you will mm, spend your time on moving along this tape, and this will depend. So one step on RAM model on the computer will uh, be say some polynomial number of steps on the Turing machine. Because you maybe you need to go and seek for your data, and each step will count, and this will be a big multiplier. But polynomiality still survives. So this is why it is, it is used uh, by theoretical computer scientists as a sort of measure of tractability. Of course, a gross one, but very robust, and allows us to uh, discuss these uh, hard uh, this uh, say re where really the trade-off is not just cube versus square, but say polynomial versus non-polynomial. So it's a very say good border of tractable versus non-tractable problems in asymptotic sense. And as we've seen, that for DNF and for two CNF, we have polynomial algorithms. And I didn't write down here the real estimations because I don't know what computational model we're using. And I don't know the details of the implementation. So, for example, for 2CNF, how do we solve satisfiability in polynomial time? Well, we uh, apply resolutions, but how is this uh, data organized? How do we organize the list of them? How do we know which resolution to apply? All of this can be done in different ways, and this will give us a bit different uh, things complexity-wise. For algorithms, but it's all still in the polynomial world. And for DNF, again, we just check all the clauses, find a satisfiable one, but again, we don't know how it's organized in the memory and how far can we do it. In short, it's written that these problems belong to class P. So P stands for polynomial, but uh, uh, P is a bit more restrictive than just being polynomial. So P also, this notation also implies that uh, the answer is yes or no. So P is the class of polynomial, polynomially time decidable decision problems. So it's just it say satisfiability takes some input data and says yes or no. So the class of functions which re return something else, so which returns some more complicated things, they're called some, some, some sometimes FP functional polynomial. So this is decision class. And for CNFs, for general, CNF situation is different. By now, it's, well, I hope that I'm not outdated because science emerges rapidly. But uh, as far as I know, it's unknown to the researchers in the world whether it is P. So no polynomial time algorithm is known for deciding satisfiability of general CNFs or the same for chain checking tautologicity of uh, general DNFs, or the same as, uh, say, for checking satisfiability for arbitrary Boolean formula. It's even harder. It's not no so such algorithm is known. But however, it's highly unlikely that it is in P, due to the following theory. So uh, um, people tried to solve many problems which look like uh, checking satisfiability for CNF. So such problems include, say, Subgraph isomorphism, uh, 
So you have a graph, and where the driver is a subgraph isomorphic to a given graph. Again, uh, it's a search problem. You have to seek for something. And it's uh, unlike this satisfiability of a CNF, which looks a bit artificial, that problem is uh, very, well, looks very close to things which are useful because what was searching for a subgraph, you have a big data structure and inside it you want to find a pattern. So it's like searching on the web, but on the web you search for patterns which are words or sentences. Here you should search for a graph like pattern. It's basically the same. Knapsack problem, whether you can uh, organize your elements in a knapsack, subset sum problem and stuff like that. We'll discuss them later. So all these problems are for searching for something. So once you have found it, it's easy to check that you are right. You found a satisfying assignment, trivially check. But uh, all known algorithms for doing that, for see seeking for this assignment, or for seeking of this isomorphism or something like that, they include, in a sense, all this enumeration, this brute force search. And for no of these problems, uh, people found a solution. So no solution was found, polynomial one. Uh, despite people tried hard. In the middle of the 20th century, there was this so sort of, well, good algorithmic problems, they should be solved somehow, but they couldn't be solved. Okay. So what does that really mean? Uh, this means that uh, probably these are really hard things. So this class is called NP, and the theorem, which is called Kuklevin theorem, which I'm going to prove in this course, it's not that hard, by the way, that if you can uh, satisfy, you can if you can solve satisfiability for CNFs in polynomial time, then you can prove satisfy, then you can solve any of these NP problems also in polynomial time. So it's one of the, it's, it's the hardest one. This is what I meant when I said that this is a good model example. That actually any problem which uh, involves searching for something, finding out whether there exists an object with given properties, if these properties are checkable fast in a polynomial time, it can be modeled by uh, finding a satisfying assignment of a CNF. And so uh, the current state of art is that we have a substitute of this a theorem that it is not polynomial solvable. So we say as follows, that if P is not equal to NP, which is uh, highly uh, likely to be true, but we don't know how to prove it, then uh, CNF is not, uh, satisfiability for CNF is not checkable in polynomial time. So this is weaker than just saying that this is not solvable. This is how it works. And uh, this is what we're going to discuss. So we're going to de define this class NP, and we're going to define it to be NP complete, and we'll also discuss related topics. So as I said, this class P and NP, they're classes for decision problems, which means that um, we just answer yes or no. There are related classes which correspond to search problems, for example. A search problem says that, okay, I want to find say the satisfying assignment. I want to find that object, not only to say that it exists, if it exists. There are also counting problems. I want to count the number of satisfying assignments, or I want to show them all, or I want to count the parity of their number, whatever does it mean, and stuff like that. And all these are related to NP and NP completeness. We'll discuss this in this course. So we'll discuss P, we'll discuss counting P, uh, search problems, and stuff like that. The running examples will be connected to Boolean logic, so we we'll already see that uh, our object that we're searching for is the satisfying assignment, and the problem is satisfiability, and also total logicity, and connected to them, maybe counting the satisfying assignments. And another thing will be also graph theory. Uh, so we'll also discuss such problems in graphs. Well, one of them, subgraph isomorphism, was already presented. Uh, we'll start with basics of graph theory and uh, go for this stuff further in the course. So uh, during the course, we'll try to highlight uh, possible connections and applications to computer science, to practical things like data analysis. But again, alas, given that the course is quite short, I uh, will not be able to go in deep details, but uh, we'll have something on the practical part. So, uh, this is all for the theoretical material for today. I made it a bit shorter in order to also accommodate some time for uh, organizational um, things. 
So if you have questions or comments, please uh, do it now. Um, if not, then uh, let me in the oh, end. Sorry, oh? uh, where we can find the presentation? Uh, well, I will uh, post it on. I will generate a web page for the course and post it there also on the on Teams. I'm, I think to, to tonight or something like that. So in the general discussion, there will be a link to the presentation and also to the video. The video is being recorded and I will post it on YouTube. So all the materials will will be published in due course. OK, so. Um, about the organization of the workflow of the course in general. So as I said, the course uh, so formally it consists of two uh, in class activities, but also there will be uh, independent out of the class activities. So uh, technically will be three uh, things we are going to do. So there are lectures on which I will say tell some theory and uh, discuss some examples well, traditional usually for lectures. Then we'll have practical classes. The practical classes uh, will be connected to, say, mathematical problem solving. So without computer, with pen and paper, just you will uh, practice in this uh, material. So say today we'll have a practice in Boolean logic with resolution, with stuff like that. So for practical classes, uh, we'll have two groups. Uh, uh, one, and I believe that the normal thing to do is that one of them is going to be physical and another one going to be virtual. And for the physical group, there will be another instructor, which is, this is Yakov Pirovkin, who will come to, I think will come here in several minutes and I will introduce him. And I will stay on, on Teams because uh, just the four lectures, I have the presentation and I show it both online and uh, in class. For practical classes, of course, they will involve some activity from the students, and it's usually hard to combine physical and virtual. So in physical, it's useful to use the whiteboard. He will use the virtual whiteboard, and maybe but we'll discuss it in the end of today's class, how do we separate. So uh, this will going to be the practical class. And uh, the third thing is going to be programming assignments. We'll have two or three, probably two of them, uh, which uh, you will, uh, I will announce them on the lectures and give all the necessary materials, so uh, some inspirations during the lecture and also post necessary links. And you will have, as usual, you have deadlines. As you, there are many of you, probably I will uh, implement some automatical grading system because, well, otherwise I will just get buried in all these uh, checking of tasks. This is a bit unfortunate because uh, this excludes all sort of code reviewing and stuff like that. If you wish to discuss details of your code, then just email separately. Or if you, if you experience problems, you can email me or you can uh, uh, just discuss it during the breaks in class. So this is all, all possible. And also due to this um, automatic grading and stuff like that, the deadlines, I hope that they will be strict, that uh, that uh, the system, or there will be some uh, reductions of the grades if you fail to go into the deadline. So these will be two uh, home tasks, which are programming ones. And uh, the third home assignment will be the, uh, actually the midterm theoretical pre-exam. So it will include problem solving and answering theoretical questions in written form. Again, uh, we could have done the midterm in, in class, but it's uh, it's an unfortunate waste of time. We have only six classes and it's bad to just spend one for the midterm. And uh, this is, um, this is uh, not that good. Mm. And another thing is that if you do some activity in class, which is the checking one, so it's a sort of exam, then it puts people into unequal conditions. The people who are at home watching via Teams and people in class, they're in a nervous situation. So all the assignments during the term, they will be uh, take home. And in the end, there will be the final exam, uh, which also contributes to the final mark which is going to be uh you you can you could pass it uh also I, I believe it's also going to be take home but with a very strict deadline 
So in the morning it gets published, in the evening you, you say it's 6 p.m. you should submit it. So it's not just for a week or something like that, but you submit it. So it's a real exam, but also all people are or are online just to make you in equal conditions. Uh, you're uh, saying that uh, we will uh, take the exam at home? Uh, the final exam, well, it will be, uh, it will be say, online. Online. So it means that you well, I give you the tasks and oh, okay. say in, in, you you are given several hours to but but you do it well you can do it from I home from here. Someone in other place are really participating taking exam but it's some kind of something like a home task or no no it's, it's it will be the, well you 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 are going to so your your home tasks will contribute to your mark. Okay, As, I, uh, I understand. Yes, and if you if you are say what they called accumulated grade is high. And even you could get exempt from uh, passing the finals. We'll discuss it later when it comes to the finals. Also, I have a question about the possibility of skipping this course. Yes, yes, I will, I will, I will say it now, exactly. So th this is about the people who are going to attend the course and who wish to uh, obtain a mark for that. So what happens, uh, so there is a possibility to get exempt from this course or to withdraw from that. Let me discuss it carefully in order for you not to have questions. I wrote something in the global chat or in, in Teams. I hope you read that. But uh, let me re say it in a sense. So uh, what is the withdrawal? So first, who is eligible? So the first category of people who are eligible for that is the people who got their bachelor from the computer science department at this university. So if you graduated from the computer science department at HSE, you are not obliged to take the course. You may do this. If you wish to do this, you have to consult with your study office. Uh, but if you withdraw, then the course completely disappears for you. And it will not appear in your final, say, uh, metrical, your final uh, list of grades. So you just, you just not, it's not, not in your plan. So if you are not a graduate from a bachelor program of HSE University Computer Science, then there is a possibility to pass a withdrawal test. Uh, so uh, the withdrawal test, uh, again, do it only if you wish to get exempt from the course. So if you wish to pass it, it's not a way to pass it in, say, one test. If you successfully pass the withdrawal, then the course disappears for you and will not get any mark for it. I just inform the study office that uh, this person already knows basics of this street math. Well, suppose he graduated from bachelor, I don't know, at MIT. Of course, everything is known for you, something like that. So uh, that gets exempt. If you wish to attend the course, then this is not for you. Just ignore this information. If you wish to do it, then uh, uh, I hope that you uh, are able to read the general chat at, at Teams, right? So in the end of this week, uh, so uh, let me actually consult with you. So is Saturday a good day for you? Do you have, or do you have many classes on Saturday? Okay, then let it let it be for two days. So just in order for you to make so it will Friday and Saturday. So Friday morning I publish uh, the withdrawal test. Uh, you have two days for passing it. So Saturday evening you should submit it. It will be a theoretical test, including uh, theoretical questions, um, some problem solving, uh, a bit of uh, programming, but not uh, you should not program actually anything. It will be questions about, say, programming, like uh, what is the complexity of Quicksort or something like that. So uh, you have time uh, for, for doing that. And uh, so there's something, uh, yes, about attendance, I will, uh, I will answer it in, in a minute. Uh, so, um, mm, you you write this down in written form and just submit it to me by email. Uh, then I check it and uh, at the beginning of next week I inform you and inform the study office that if you pass this test successfully, uh, that means that you should do most of this test stuff in that. So it's not just pass as a uh, satisfactory mark. It's just you should do it excellent because this means that. Uh, Get, get, getting a withdrawal means that you know discrete math okay, so it's just you don't need the course because you know mostly everything. And then I inform you and inform the study office that you are exempt from the course and just we say goodbye. So this is what you can do. And you can do it, uh, uh, as I said, so uh, I think tonight I will uh, tell about this again and uh, Friday morning I publish uh, the um, 
task for withdrawal in the in Teams and also on the course web page, which will be also advertised on Teams. And you have uh, two days, say, till 6 p.m. Saturday or till 8 p.m. Saturday to do it. And uh, on Monday, I check it. So this is about the withdrawal, if you wish to do this. If you wish to attend the course, then it's information is not for you. If you graduated from HEC Computer Science but still wish to attend the course, uh, then you should consult the study office because probably they have already cut you off from the course. Okay, so about attendance. Of course, I motivate all of you to attend the uh, classes, the lectures and the seminars. Uh, unfortunately, this is not always possible. I received some emails, so there was some information like you said that you have intersection with other classes. Well, unfortunate, but well, this life. I received some emails from people from other time zones for which uh, this time is inconvenient, say it's uh, West Coast USA, for example. Uh, so people are there, unfortunately, due to epidemical restrictions, this is um, um, this is life. So in for therefore, we do not uh, use attendance as uh, a way to control you. So you are master students, grown up enough to control yourself. And uh, we do not check for attendance and we do not uh, use it as a method of control. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, right, uh, the assignments should be done on time. And failing the deadlines is bad and will result in poor grades, in, in worse grades in a sense. Yes, the slides will be shared uh, and I will put put the link on and maybe maybe post even the PDF in Teams. Uh, uh, I think tonight, just in order to be in a, no no not now not to be in a haste, but nevertheless the, the, this will be shared. Yes, all all the slides and also the also the video will be shared. So uh, at least for lectures, for seminars, I think also yes because there are people who wish that. Okay, so yep. Okay, so that's about all. Uh, now, uh, what's what next? So uh, the lecture stops. It stops here. Uh, mm. Uh huh. Okay. Yes, this is a module class. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, this is one module, so it's half a semester. Uh, and oh, this is Yakov Yerovkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is Yakov Yerovkin who will teach the in class version of the seminars. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, another, yeah, so this is a one module, so it's six weeks. The midterm will be in the middle, so it's after roughly the third week. And uh, the um, final will be after the module, so it will be in late October. Uh, the only situation where it can post be postponed to the uh, to the big say session in the end of the semester is when you fail or if you do not attend the exam. So if you are, have to take this what's called Russian period, the uh, extra curricular exam, this will be postponed to the end of semester. I hope this won't happen. So yeah. And about the distribution of weights, I don't remember them by the moment, so I will just. Uh, Post them also on Teams and on the web. So there, there are in the official program of the course. They haven't changed since then, but uh, I, I will look it up and then put it there. Okay.